If you were to look at the video game industry of today, you might think gaming is in a golden age. Video games have never been more popular, professional gaming is a growing and respected sport, and game publishers see record profits year after year. This surface level success, however, conceals many of the core issues plaguing modern games. Hypermonetization, egregious laziness, and a total lack of passion or vision. In terms of quality and actual care put into games, modern gaming has been on a consistent decline for close to a decade now. From predatory microtransactions, to broken, unoriginal games, to the current drought of new and interesting IPs, gaming has been reduced from a form of entertainment and artistry to a corporatized money-making venture. As someone who's been into gaming for the vast majority of my life, as someone who genuinely appreciates the passion and artistry present in games, this mass corporatization and denigration of the medium is depressing at best and infinitely vexing at worst. I know I'm not alone in this stance either. The countless failures and disappointments of the modern games industry has left most gamers tired and frustrated. To that end, I want to chart the slow descent of this once great industry, look at where it's heading, and what we should do in response. Like and subscribe. Before we can discuss the dismal state of modern gaming, I want to first look at the era which preceded it, along with what made it unique. I think few would argue that the mid-90s to late 2000s was a true golden age of gaming, and for a number of reasons. While the actual quality of games from this time period can't be understated and will be discussed, one of the biggest factors in this golden age was the state of gaming in the broader games industry. Gaming was considered a more nerdy or unusual hobby back then. You weren't getting bullied at school for not having the latest Fortnite skin, but for playing video games in the first place. This relative unpopularity meant that the games industry was just a fraction of its current size. Conversely, game developers and publishers were much more numerous back then. Various small and independent groups all competed in the open gaming market, and you'd either sink or swim depending on the quality of your games. While many studios sunk, those that swam were handsomely rewarded, and typically redoubled their efforts for their next project. Furthermore, these small studios were often staffed and led by dedicated gamers and enthusiasts. This naturally leads to much greater passion and care put into the games they produced. Take for example Bungie back in the early 2000s. Their singular goal when producing the Halo trilogy was to make the best, most enjoyable game possible, and it shows in their outlook. The difference between good enough and awesome is, is, is so big, and I mean, there's this, this, this standard set by everyone here that, I mean, good enough sucks. You can't do good enough. It's, it's, a, it's a hard kind of thing to live up to, but it's, uh, I mean, the game's gonna be better for it. We are the most cynical people. Like, we are the jaded crowd who if a game doesn't entertain us in five minutes, we stop playing it. The passion you see here is honestly commendable, and was something found in abundance both at Bungie and the broader games industry. In addition to having an industry clearly committed to quality, the technological development seen in the 5th, 6th, and 7th generations dramatically expanded what could be done with video games. This is perhaps best demonstrated by the transition from 2D to 3D, swapping pixels for polygons. An additional dimension not only enabled new and interesting forms of gameplay, but allowed for beautiful art styles and actually realistic graphics. These are your Killer 7s for the former, and Re 4s for the latter. The size and scope of games also increased substantially in this time period, going from megabytes in size to gigabytes. Whereas games on cartridges had to make best use of very limited real estate, CDs allowed for about as much game as you wanted, and at then modern graphics. Finally, Internet access had reached hundreds of millions, even billions by this time period, meaning games no longer had to be primarily single-player or couch co-op titles. In short, the games industry not only had the technology to make new and engaging games, but the will and passion to do so. And I feel the results truly speak for themselves. Gaming during this golden age was, as the name implies, a pretty good time. Quite simply put, gamers were spoiled for choice in the 90s and 2000s. While shovelware and cheap cash grabs certainly were a thing, you had an absolute smorgasbord of quality tiles to choose from no matter what you were looking for. If you wanted to play something on your own, just pop in Tony Hawk or literally anything from Nintendo at the time. If some friends were over, you had Halo or Mario Kart to rage at and laugh over. And if you wanted to meet cool new people on the wide world of web, WoW was still relevant, and not terrible. Gaming as a whole was just fun. People treated it as an enjoyable, exciting hobby. 
You'd hear from a friend that the new Scrimbo Bimblo slaps, drop 40 or 50 bucks on it, and have a good time. Gamers had hope in the industry, and while expectations weren't always met and missteps were had, it was good for a time. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. The Roman Empire experienced unmatched prosperity and security for hundreds of years before its slow and pitiful death in the 5th century. Gaming is no different, and much like the Huns and Goths who brought low the Romans, it was an outside force which plunged the games industry into its dark age, the smartphone. In 1998, Nokia released their 6110 model of mobile phones. The 6110 offered numerous improvements and updates over the earlier Nokia 2110, one of which being the addition of Snake. Snake is a game you've likely heard of, seen, or played at some point. You play as a snake navigating a plane in search of food, and needs to maneuver around your ever-lengthening body as you go from point to point. It's a simple little game, something you could play for a few minutes at a time, but its inclusion in the 6110 was one of its most liked features. In line with this, mobile phones going forward would often include short little games similar in scope to Snake. Many of these games were shipped with the phone itself, and while it was possible to download additional games, they were never terribly common or popular. The system, however, would be completely turned on its head in 2007 upon the release of the iPhone. The iPhone, and more specifically its App Store, offered users a variety of applications and games for purchase. Much like the iPhone itself, this storefront proved wildly successful. Though it released with only 500 apps, in just two years this number increased to well over 100,000, and these apps were downloaded over 2 billion times. Initially, the App Store would sell their games for a one-time, upfront cost. You know, how games were always sold. This business model would eventually be expanded in 2009 to give apps and their developers new and exciting ways of making money. The biggest addition were in-app purchases, a system we would now call microtransactions. While many apps made ungodly amounts of money off this system, perhaps the most influential and iconic game in this landscape is Candy Crush. Candy Crush, released in late 2012, is nothing special as a game. You match three pieces of candy in a row to earn points and accomplish objectives. Match three titles had been around for some time and have had successful entries such as Bejeweled. What sets Candy Crush apart from its peers, however, was its method of monetization, predatory microtransactions. While Candy Crush was free to download, it was seemingly designed to incur, then profit off of addiction. First and foremost, the actual gameplay rewards you at every step, complimenting and praising you for making the right move or just having pieces fall in the right places. You're given dopamine hit after dopamine hit with easy levels until you reach a difficult one you can't quite beat. Candy Crush operates on a life system, and once you run out of lives, you're cut off from the flashy lights and easy dopamine. You can either wait a ridiculous, uncomfortable amount of time until you can get your dopamine fix, or just pay 99 cents for an immediate refill. Both options funnel you into playing, and eventually paying more and more, and it was this scanner box design that led to Candy Crush's success. To put it in perspective, Candy Crush alone brought in about $1.1 billion in 2014. That same year, the entire games industry had revenues of $85 billion. A single game with a basic art style and simple gameplay loop made up over 1% of the games industry, all because it had an unbelievably effective microtransaction system. This runaway success told the games industry two things. First of all, video games were big money, a business venture that could be insanely profitable. This is not to say the games industry wasn't already massive, it was raking in tens of billions at the time, but it put into perspective just how much money you can make off of games. Second, a game doesn't have to be good in the traditional sense to be profitable. Making a game that is legitimately fair and enjoyable doesn't have to be a prerequisite for success. It just has to have the right mechanisms to fleece people of their money and have them come back for more. It was around this time period of the early to mid-2010s that you began to see the exportation of this philosophy from the mobile market to gaming as a whole. It's this philosophy which treats games more as a dry business just to make money, rather than an earnest form of art and escapism, that led to this slow decline of gaming. For anyone who's paid even a modicum of attention to the broader games industry over the past few years, you'd find it mired in scandals, mediocrity, and disappointment. The reason for this goes back to the philosophy shift mentioned earlier. Games aren't being made to be enjoyed, but to make money. It's this hard shift in priorities that has just gutted the soul of gaming, and replaced it with flowcharts, focus groups, and revenue projections. Take for example the explosive growth in microtransactions over the past decade or so. Modern games are often replete with issues such as slow progression, unbalanced gameplay, 
or a lack of content. This isn't a mistake. These issues are introduced on purpose, with the only way to overcome them being microtransactions. It doesn't matter if fair systems are dropped for a less engaging gameplay loop. It doesn't matter if microtransactions prioritize the size of your bank account rather than in-game skill. It doesn't matter if microtransactions have led to some of the most addictive, predatory systems imaginable. Microtransactions make an incomprehensible amount of money. That's the only reason they're so prevalent. To the games industry, it's more important that their septuagenarian shareholders see a 15% APY than actually give their customer base a semi-decent product. Outside of making games with these predatory, money-first systems, modern games are often released in a broken and buggy state. The recent poster child of incomplete garbage is none other than Saints Row. Aside from having some genuinely cringe-inducing writing and gameplay that's boring two hours in, the game just does not function. Pull up literally any full-length review, and you'll see a deluge of bugs, glitches, and broken features in this game. Saints Row isn't an outlier in this regard, either. You had Battlefield 2042 last year, and Cyberpunk 2077 the year before that. Both incredibly hyped games that should not have shipped in the state they were in. The people at the helm, and more specifically the publishers, just stopped caring. They knew a bunch of gullible saps and stupid teens would drop $60 on their latest shitfest, so why even bother? Worst of all, if a game totally flops, many of these studios and publishers are so large they can just eat the losses, shelve their broken game, and move on to the next lazily made entry. Finally, this corporatized business-centric approach to game development has just killed any passion and vision within the larger industry. Rather than prioritizing player experience and creating new IPs, game developers are more preoccupied with garbage sequels, unnecessary remakes, and shameless trend chasing. For me, the epitome of this visionless, trend-chasing game development has been the new Halo trilogy. I use the term trilogy loosely here, as the stories in each game have little to do with each other and are all pretty mediocre in their own right. Outside of this lackluster writing, every new Halo aped mechanics from other popular games, presumably because money. 4 has score streaks and loadouts, 5 has pay-to-win loot boxes, and Infinite has a live-service season pass that's so barren and devoid of content it's genuinely shocking. One of the most groundbreaking, influential, and just plain fun series ever created was utterly castrated by out-of-touch, money-first suits. Most tragically of all, this fate has fallen countless other IPs and series, all reduced to shells of their former selves by visionless hacks and unoriginal frauds. The AAA games industry has fundamentally regressed, its priorities totally misaligned with the point of gaming, and unfortunately, it's a situation that I don't see changing anytime soon. It's blatantly obvious that money is the biggest, if not single motivating factor in making games nowadays, and if that's the industry's goal, then they're certainly succeeding. There's no longer a major incentive to make interesting or good games, when you can just copy-paste total schlock every year and still make billions. You can vote with your wallet to change things, sure, but the next whale they catch completely cancels out whatever difference you might have made. Furthermore, the AAA games industry has largely consolidated under a select few major corporations and studios. This, coupled with the increasing barriers to entry due to technological advancement, means there's little reason for innovation, and few grounds for competition. The whole of AAA gaming has just become stale and sad, and out-of-touch ghouls like Phil Spencer and Andrew Wilson are perfectly fine with that. I mentioned at the beginning that I discussed what should be done regarding the modern gaming industry's dismal state, and I feel the best option for gamers is nothing. The modern games industry at this point is a joke. I think by now this should be fairly obvious. Huge conglomerates just push out unoriginal, unenjoyable, and or incomplete titles year after year, yet are able to bank off of microtransactions in a lazy consumer base. Unless CEOs actually start caring about art, outside of money laundering, or if predatory microtransactions get regulated into oblivion, I highly doubt there will be any major changes in the industry. So why bother with it at that point? It's better to avoid this constant deluge of disappointment than hope COD 37 will be marginally better than its predecessors. Instead, Rather than deal with the cultural void that is the modern games industry, just go back to that golden age. A friend of mine remarked that it's sad some of the best games ever have already been made, and while this is pretty accurate, it's also true. There are countless excellent titles from back in the day that many of us haven't gone around to or didn't hear of when they were released. They're games often made with passion, and because you couldn't just patch in fixes back in the day, they're actually complete. Furthermore, strong communities for retro tiles are still going strong to this day, 
be it for speedrunning or just for enthusiasts of a particular series. Alternatively, while AAA publishers and studios have seemingly abandoned passion for green slips of paper, you're much more likely to find well-crafted, lovingly made games from indie studios. From early classics such as Super Meat Boy and Binding of Isaac, to recent titles like Hades or Ultra Kill, indie games have consistently churned out innovative and engaging games actually worth your time. While there are weird and bad entries in the indie scene, at the very least it's a space that cares about the art of gaming along with their community. Finally, if you absolutely have to play the latest Gears of Halo Theft Auto V or Gorbino's Quest, get it at a discount. Or, uh, at a discount. All in all, even if the modern games industry is in its dark age, it doesn't mean gaming has to be. There are more than enough excellent games new and old to play and enjoy. Games that are free of the hollow influence of this once great industry. Thank you so much for watching this video. While I haven't covered gaming content much on this channel, outside of a video on last year's Activision fiasco, it is a topic I am interested in and fairly passionate about. The general state of gaming at present, along with my discontent for it, was something I wanted to discuss, as it's been a perennial issue for years now. I hope you found my perspective on this matter interesting, or at the very least informative. Maybe leave me a little comment with your thoughts on this. With that out of the way, shake hands with a like, hug the subscribe button, and that bell. Until next time, take care.